Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 79 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me today is retired Special Agent John Whiteside III. John joined the Federal Bureau of Investigation in 1971 after graduating from Temple University. He spent much of his career in counterintelligence investigations during the Cold War before retiring in 2001. Since then, he's worked as a private investigator and as a government consultant. I invited John onto the podcast after reading his book, Fool's Mate, about one of the highest profile investigations of his entire career. John led the investigation into Robert Stephen Lipka, who provided classified documents to the Soviet government from his position as a U.S. Army soldier assigned to the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland in the mid-1960s. Lipka's espionage went undiscovered for decades until 1992, when an investigative tip surfaced from a completely unexpected source and led John and his fellow investigators into a years-long investigation, which culminated with Lipka's arrest. But before we dive into the story of the investigation into Lipka, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who's also supporting me on Patreon, including Max E. and Christian S., your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. John, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Justin. It's a pleasure to be with you. Great, great. I'm glad to hear it. I'd heard some of the highlights from Lipka's story before, but after I read your book, I realized I had missed out on a lot. So I'm really excited to discuss all of that with you today. I'm happy to talk to you with it, about it. It's been a wonderful case and a great experience. That's fantastic. So I, I want to start with you before we actually get to Lipka. What was it that led you to join the FBI in the first place? After I w when I was in college, I was majoring in health and physical education. Not that I really wanted to be a teacher. I was unsure as to what I wanted to be, but that was the best option for me at the time. One of the interesting things is when I was a young boy, I used to read the Hardy Boy mystery stories and was infatuated with them. Probably read every one of the books. I also liked to read True Detective magazine as I grew up, and I enjoyed a lot of television shows the FBI, for example, and I think there was a show called I Spy in the mid-60s. So I had this little desire to be involved in law enforcement. But at the time I went to college from 1965 to 1969, there really weren't any law enforcement or criminal justice classes. So that really kind of wasn't an option for me to major in. So what I did, though, when I was in college, after my junior year, my parents had a place in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, a summer home. And that town was about 1,500 people during the winter time, But in the summer, it blew up to about 20,000 people vacationing and wanting to be at the beach, go fishing, things like that. And one of the things the eight-man police department did in Stone Harbor was hire six additional college kids to be summer seasonal officers. And in 1968, I actually took that position was a summer policeman in Stone Harbor for three summers from 68 through 1970. That gave me my real desire to get involved in law enforcement. And after about a month of teaching physical education in an elementary school in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, I just decided that law enforcement was for me. So I started to apply to the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. And fortunately enough, in 1970, October of 1970, just in starting my second year of teaching, the FBI offered me a position. So without any, any doubts whatsoever, I took the position and went to training school in April of 1971. Oh, wow. And the rest is history, so to speak. And the rest is history. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 
So what kind of cases did you work on before the Lipka investigation began? Anything other, you know, any other big formative cases or really interesting ones for you? Well, when I was in my first office was in Cleveland, Ohio, and then in the resident agency in Akron, Ohio, I mostly worked as a new agent, deserter cases, because the Vietnam War was occurring. We had a lot of military deserters that we would capture and turn over to the military and stolen car cases from interstate transportation and stolen property. It was after that first year, I was transferred to Greenville, Mississippi. And in Mississippi, I got to work a number of civil rights cases for three years. After that, I was transferred to New York, and that's when I first started working foreign counterintelligence cases. I, I didn't really like them, so I switched to an organized crime squad, which was something I always wanted to do. And I did enjoy the organized crime work. I was working the Genovese crime family, but there was so much work involving wiretaps that I just couldn't sit there for eight hours a day with a set of headphones on and listen, hopefully, to get a little piece of evidence in an in a, in a organized crime case. So I went back to counterintelligence cases and actually stayed with counterintelligence cases for the rest of my career. Oh, wow. So that was over 20 years then of CI cases? Yeah, I would figure 24 to 25 years of CI wow. cases strictly. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Boy. So after that, is that just a an election that you can make or, or did they just decide that that's what you're really good at? So you stay in that particular path. It's pretty much an election. It wasn't an election when I transferred to New York. All, all people coming to New York, regardless of your experience, were assigned to either counterintelligence or either Soviet or the rest of the world. And you had to kind of pay your dues and to get your way off those squads. But for me, I think in the long run, it was the best thing that ever happened because eventually fell in love with the work and it became a true passion for me. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine it, it seems like something that was tremendously interesting, especially during the years that you were working it from what, like 70, 75 through 2000 or so. I mean, so much was going on during those years, especially in the mid eighties, I think. Yeah, that was the period we used to call the, the year of the spies was 19, I think 85. And there were so, because there were so many premier espionage arrests, it was John Walker. Uh, I think there was Clyde Lee Conrad. There was Pelton. There was Pollard. A number of real high-profile spies. And it was really a great time to work before, before the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. However, we knew in the FBI that that wouldn't diminish the efforts of the Russian intelligence services. Congress was fooled a bit, but we never were because nothing ever slowed down. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense from 91, 95 and on. Yeah, I can see that. That's actually something that's come up briefly in the past was that most people thought that it was the end of history. I think that they were calling it around that time. And in the practical sense, it was not at all. It was still business as usual for so many people on both sides. Yeah, I would like to give you a comparison. I think if I don't, if I recall this correctly, in 1985, something like 22% of the FBI worked some kind of foreign counterintelligence and espionage cases, 22%. After the Soviet Union collapsed, only 11% of the FBI was targeted against both counterintelligence cases and terrorism cases. Resources were placed otherwise, other places in the FBI. And, and that just shows you how, how we responded to one country changing, but nothing changed in terms of the work. So, it, you know, a lot more needed to be done and wasn't. Well, yeah, that's unfortunate that some people were kind of caught unawares. You know, they, they see some changes on the news and some outward changes and don't recognize that a lot of the same people are still in power and still have the same goals as in the past. Exactly. And we, you know, suddenly they see there's more personnel abuse than other places. And that's where we were used pretty much until 2001 after mm -hmm. the World Trade Center incidents. Right, right. It's unfortunate that it took something like that. And so, yes, so now we're back. The, the three primary functions of the FBI are counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and cyber crimes. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a, that's a huge pivot from years past then. Exactly. The pendulum swings back and mm -hmm. forth. Certainly. 
So as we mentioned in the introduction, this Lipka, he, he essentially got away with his espionage activities for many, many, many years, long after he had stopped. So what was it that brought him back into focus and made him a target of an FBI investigation so many years after he had stopped? There was a fellow by the name of Vasily Matrokin, who was a retired KGB officer, who during his career as a KGB archivist, grew disenchanted with the Soviet system. He had the opportunity to read a lot of files and realized that Joseph Stalin, his great leader, was truly a vile and evil man. And Matrokin wasn't real happy with the promotion or a demotion that he had received from the KGB. So at some point he decided he would start making notes of a lot of the KGB files as he would prepare them for transfer to a new FBI, a KGB building. Matrokin did that and he decided eventually uh, for a number of personal reasons and family reasons that he would try to defect to the West and use this information that he had, had gleaned from KGB files as a way out of, of Russia. So he actually did go to Riga, Latvia by train. He went to the embassy the American embassy on several occasions trying to pass off his information. And all the times he went there, he was refused. They, they didn't see his information as valuable for some reason. So he eventually tried the British embassy and some security officer at the British embassy obviously realized the information that he had was extremely valuable. And the Brits took care of him, got he and his family out of the country to repatriate him and then subsequently went back and got all of his files and folders that he had been amassing. So it was from that information that Matrokin provided that we got the first information that Robert Lipka was indeed involved in espionage. Okay, so in the Matrokin archives, I can only imagine what it was like for the first people to kind of get hold of those and actually start reading through and just have everything wide open, you know, all these questions that they'd had for years. But was he in there by name? Did it say Robert Lipka anywhere? Or was it just clues as to the age or the position or something like that of the person on the inside? Well, it was interesting that the information Matrokin saw was really not the file on Robert Lipka. All he saw was an abstract that was written to be sent to the Soviet KGB illegals unit describing who Lipka was and what he was all about. So the information that he provided was two paragraphs long, fully identified Lipka, identified him by full name, Robert Stephen Lipka, by his age or possibly date of birth, said that he was assigned to the U.S. Army and based at the National Security Agency. He went on to say that from the period of September 1965, until August of 1967, Lepka passed over 200 top secret documents using a series of clandestine dead drops, a period of 50 drops over that time period. He was paid $27,000 for his efforts. He subsequently left uh, NSA and the Army and returned to Millersville, Pennsylvania, where he was planning to attain, attend college. The information also said that his wife, Patricia, was a nursing student or a nurse. So he actually gave us some real solid information about Robert Lipka and enough to check out to see if there was really indeed such a person. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible to have everything laid out there right in front of you. And just, I mean, right at the beginning of an investigation, based on everything that was in there, and I, I in a way, I want to kind of skip to the end, but was everything in that file, did it turn out to be accurate in the end after you concluded your investigation? Was there anything in there that he had gotten wrong, for example? Pretty much every single piece was accurate. There is a question about the amount of money he was paid. There is some evidence to indicate he was paid subsequently, was paid a lot more money. So as far as Matroka knew, at least at the time he saw that abstract, I think the information he provided was completely accurate. Well, yeah, that's just seems like manna from heaven for somebody in your position there to get that kind of, you know, treasure trove of information. 
It certainly was. It was a gift. But again, this could be nothing more than a KGB effort to disrupt the FBI investigations, something to stall us and, and direct us at a person who really never did commit espionage. So sure. there was still a lot of work to do to verify the information to see if it was real. And then if I, we verified it, we would need to make a prosecutable case against Lipka. Right, right. So you can't, you are not able to simply take information from a defector and use that as actual evidence, right? That's the beginning of the investigation, but that by itself is not enough to get a conviction, right? Like you have to actually catch him in espionage or something like that in order to convict him for those charges. Yes, exactly. We'd have to either catch him in the act or develop a case using the original information to see if, in fact, he was had committed espionage or was still committing espionage. And that's another part of this. We had no idea whether Lipka was alive, dead, or still active. So that's why we conduct the investigations with the target of prosecution in, in the future if, if the case would work that way. Sure. So what was what were Lipka's motivations for committing espionage in the first place? Lipka's motivation was simply using his own words, pure green greed. He just wanted the money. He was a greedy mm. guy. It was simply that. Wow. Pure green greed. That's amazing. Did he? Yeah. I guess he didn't feel bad for selling out his organization or his position or anything like that. Just the money trumped everything in those in that case. Yeah, the money trumped everything. And interestingly enough, we would later find well after the case was over that he actually had a first cousin who was serving in Vietnam during the time he was committing his espionage. And he was providing one of the things he was providing to the Soviets were Soviet uh, U.S. troop movements in Vietnam. So, you know, his greed even overcame any concern he might have had for the safety and well-being of his, his first cousin who was wow. serving in the army. Well, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, even to, you know, kind of the layperson, you know, they would understand that providing that kind of information to the enemy is one of the most valuable things and one of the, you know, things that pro creates the greatest risk for your own side. And that's amazing to have his own blood relative over there and wouldn't even think twice about doing that. No, he certainly did not. And he never really told us that. We learned that later from another relative of his who, who explained that to us. Okay. So was he approached or did he initiate this himself? Lipka initiated this himself by walking into the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. Uh, one day. He had some classified documents with him. The KGB examined them. They realized how good they were. Lipka asked for $400 in exchange for that information. And while he was in the embassy, the KGB handler that he had set up a series of places for him to meet over the next few weeks where he could leave NSA material or other classified material in a secluded location and thereafter go to a secondary location to pick up a packet of money. He was promised $500 each time he made one of his clandestine drops and he did just did so every two weeks. Wow. Okay. So 500 to us now doesn't sound like a great deal, but that was something like two months salary for him at the time, wasn't it? He was actually paid. Yeah, he was paid $200 a month. So if he made two intelligence drops a month, he would have made $1,000 from the wow. KGB, which was five, five times his normal salary. And I, I've told listeners before that if, you know, if you would multiply your monthly salary by five, remember this is in 1965 dollars, multiply your current salary by five and you'll see how much money that really meant to him. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I can see why that would be a powerful motivator, especially for a very young, low paid guy as he was at the time. So yeah, he was uh, only making, you know, he, he was making just $200. So, mm -hmm. and he just had a clerical position. Okay. Yeah, and it shows really just how valuable that information was is they were immediately willing to commit to a, a pretty large sum of money, you know, that frequently as well every couple of weeks. Well, NSA is probably one of the greatest targets. So they oh, had yeah. a gold mine with Robert Lipka. I can imagine. I can imagine. And how did he himself avoid getting caught? Like, how was he sneaking this amount of paper out of the office every couple of weeks? Well, he was in a, in a mailroom 
and he had access to every single piece of incoming and outgoing NSA communication all around the world. He also had access to the mail that was coming in from other American intelligence agencies like the CIA or the State Department. And what he would do when he was alone, and oftentimes he was alone in his unit, he would just take a copy of a communication from a burn bag that wasn't that was going to be destroyed and put it on his person, either inside of his hat or wrapped around his leg and would walk out of the building with it. And that's how he collected his information and how he was able to package it up later from his apartment and take it to his different dead drops. Hmm. My gosh. That's really so ironic that a position that seems very lowly and was lowly like a mailroom clerk and the burn bag guy actually has the power to do the most damage to the organization because what he did was not like compartmentalized at all. Like you said, he just got everything from everywhere. Yes. And we've also, you know, even in our own business in the FBI, uh, probably the most dangerous person, that you know, the person you'd want to recruit the most as a KGB officer would be a secretary or a file clerk because they have access to everything. Individual mm -hmm. agents only have their own cases. Right. So sometimes the, the lower person is getting paid the least is the, is the best target. Hmm. That's amazing. And I guess that at the time, the NSA did not have like a, a very robust counterintelligence program of their own if he was able to do this relatively easily and, and so frequently? Well, you know, and he went into the Army in 1963, did his basic training at Fort Dix. Then he went to Army Intelligence School, which is was Fort Holabird, which was directly across from where NSA is today. In, 19, in December of 1963, he graduated from intelligence school and was posted to NSA. He was given a top secret and a crypto clearance briefing. And for the first, I'd say, year and a half from, from December of 63 until September of 65, he's not known to have done anything wrong. He apparently did his job. Something happened in 1965 in September that just, that he decided he would try his luck as a spy. Hmm. Do you do you know what that was, or that was just the moment that he actually approached the Soviets? Well, we have two wild theories. One was he met his a woman at a dance who he fell in love with and would soon marry a year or so later, and perhaps he thought he needed money to entertain her, and another thought was when he was at Fort Holabird, they learned about a spy who had been at NSA who actually had worked in the same unit that Lipka had worked in. And this individual was caught. He was very flamboyant. He bought cars. He had a boat and he built a big fence around his house. He spent money like he shouldn't have. And he was identified and actually he took his own life rather than face prison. And I think Lipka, because of his egomania, thought he could maybe be a better spy than, than this fella. Maybe he thought about it and thought he could do it better and safer. That's the kind of person Lipka was. He was always thought he was smarter and better than everybody else. Well, yeah, that's, that's some tremendous insight into this guy's character. If he sees somebody who did the wrong thing, got caught, and chose to take his own life and he thinks to himself, I could do the same thing. That's, that's really amazing that he would have that amount of ego. And then he would take that as a challenge rather than as a warning. And I think that's exactly what he did, to be honest with you. And he did, he thought he was better than everyone. And in, in fairness to Lipka, he would still be a free man had it not been for Vasily Matrokin giving him up because he didn't <laughs> yeah. get caught. Yeah. Yeah. His, his, Ego was kind of validated in that sense for many, many years. That's pretty amazing. And we were very, very blessed that Matrokin decided to come over and that he eventually was able to share everything with the Brits and with us. Otherwise, yeah, he'd still be walking a free man. That's exactly right. Exactly. So I know that he ended up being kind of handled by a couple of the Soviet illegals at that time. And there were not, as I understand it, there were not very many illegals in the country at the time, were there? To my knowledge, there were only these two. These two illegals, we knew them by the names of Peter and Ingeborg Fisher. They were two KGB illegals who had been trained at KGB headquarters in, in Moscow, who ultimately inf were infiltrated into 
East and West Germany, where they married as a German couple. They subsequently worked their way through Europe and, and emigrated into Canada, where they lived for a few years, getting accustomed to Western ways. And about 1965 or 1966, they transferred into Buffalo, New York. And while they were in Buffalo, New York, they were identified as KGB illegals by the FBI and other intelligence services. They had been sending some communications overseas, kind of sign of life communications, everything as well, coded kind of communications. Unfortunately for them, the intelligence services were aware that this address they were sending things to was a controlled KGB facility. So they were identified when they were in Buffalo, New York, and the FBI started surveillances on them. They then moved to New York for a brief period of time and then came to Philadelphia in 1996. Well, at the same time, Lipka was actively involved in espionage. They were probably assigned to work Lipka in some way, shape, or form. The FBI in Philadelphia worked that case on those two illegals until they left in 1968. But because of that case, we were able to glean some more information to help us in our prosecution of Lipka. Hmm. Interesting. So to your knowledge, was Lipka their primary responsibility while they were here, or did they have other things going on as well? Well, we knew we had, they had other things going on as well. One of the things that happened was we had found a notebook in their apartment, when I say we, the FBI, and in that notebook were some 25 different sites along the Eastern Corridor, which contained either fuel depots or communications towers, electric company grids, places like that. They all appeared to be sabotage targets. Should a war have broken out between the Soviet Union and the United States, their job might have been to disable those facilities. In fact, we learned from the CIA that had they destroyed some of those communication sites, we would have lost all communications along the East Coast at a time of war. So they were busy doing that. I think their Lipka assignment came much later after Lipka had left the service in 1967. Ah, okay. I see. Well, that's incredible to think that they were infiltrating and taking on those kinds of like direct action kind of missions here in the U.S. That was a very different time period than what we have now, but my gosh. Well, it was so, different and there's, you know, they still use illegals. Most recently, I can only, back in 2010, which seems recently to me, <laughs> but I, I think you'll recall there were 10 KGB or Soviet illegals, Russian illegals who were arrested in the Boston and New York area. So they still do the same thing. And I don't know if all of your listeners are aware of illegals, KGB illegals, but there was a wonderful television show called The Americans, which was on FX network, it ran for six seasons, it called The Americans, about two KGB illegals living in the United States. And I would highly recommend that show, minus some of the Hollywood glory in it. But for the most part, that's exactly how KGB illegals would work. They just infiltrate themselves in the community. They seem like normal people, and they have a reason for being here that's very quietly held. And they don't do a whole lot, but what they do, it can be very devastating. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful show there. It's been a while since I watched it, so I should probably rewatch again, but I, I can't recommend it highly enough. And I guess the only thing about it that, you know, the more research I've done, I found that some of the plot lines were taken directly from real world events and just kind of adopted or adapted, I should say, to, you know, into a fictional premise. But the only thing that really stood out about the show to me is that they were constantly going on these such critical missions. Like each episode was, you know, some kind of big critical thing like assassination or turning someone inside of an organization. And but that's, you know, that's television. They have to keep the excitement. Up. Exactly. That, that was fantastic. Yeah, it was. And it just shows how they were, how they operate. And it shows the problems that they have. I mean, they have to blend in, but there's sometimes, you know, they do have some of these illegals that were arrested in 2010 did have children. Mm -hmm. We had no idea that they were illegals, Russian illegals. So it's a very powerful system. It's still used. I'm sure there's still some around. They can be very effective. And in this case, they were a big part of the, actually the takedown of Lipka. 
in the end. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So were they, I know that you were onto them, but were they actually arrested in country or were they able to get out before you moved in to arrest them? They actually, in 1967, when Lipka left the service in August, there was apparently some kind of issue with him and the Soviet handlers. And I think we like to think he wanted more money and they probably balked. We think he might have indicated that he was actually working for the federal government and everything he did was a controlled operation. So leave me alone and don't bother me ever again. And his handlers and all decided that there's no way that he was working for the American government would never give up this information that he passed. So they, they sent those illegals to make contact with Lipka. And the illegals went out and, and placed a postcard in his mailbox suggesting that he meet with them, with someone, on a certain date and time. And the interesting thing is Lipka did tell his wife. He went into the house. He lifted up that postcard. He waved it around in the air and said, he's been recontacted. He said, we're back in it. And she oh. said to him, we're out. It was stay out. Don't, don't. He says, I can't, I've got to keep my options open. So they actually made contact with Lipka, asking him to, to make contact with another at another time and place. That effort by those two illegals was why Matrokin originally wrote, the, read the uh, abstract that he saw in the file. That was telling the illegal department about who Lipka was so that these two illegals, Peter and Ingeborg Fisher, could go out and make contact at his residence. Hmm. Wow. Okay, I see. And it he was, was a nice tie. To hear from yes, it was a nice tie-in to the illegals being in the area of Philadelphia that they were in. Okay, I've got you. And he left the NSA, but he still had information of value. Did he like steal extra documents or did he just remember some stuff? I mean, why did they stay in contact with him after he left the NSA? Well, we didn't know at the time, but he did have, he did take information with him. We also believe we have subsequently determined that he was perhaps paid $150,000 in total by the KGB and that he may have been in contact with them as long as 1974. Wow. Uh, so some of his damage can, may have continued. He was, we believe, paid by them for some time. Probably they were hoping that he would finish his college degree and then come back to NSA because he was such a su successful spy. Can't prove any of that, but there are indications that that was the case. And then eventually by 1974, the KGB maybe re realized they were being played a little bit by this guy because he hadn't had any more information. There was no way he was going to go back to NSA. He knew he was free and clear, and they finally just broke contact with him. Okay, I see. Yeah, I, I can totally see the value in kind of paying him almost like a monthly retainer just on the chance that he goes back there because of what he had produced and what he could produce in the future as well. That's a absolute, you know, the, what they call it, the goose that lays the golden egg. Exactly. And we're very fortunate that he did not go back because he could have done untold amounts of damage. Sure. Did he decide not to simply because he didn't want to tr take his chances again, or was there some other reason? I think he thought he had, not only had he done what he did and been paid what he was paid, he had conned them for a few more years. And I think he, he knew the jig was up and he wasn't willing to put up with it any further. Okay. I see. That was just about the only really smart move he made after all that, I guess. But yeah, if, if he really was paid 150000 I mean, my gosh, that's a, a lot of money even now. Exactly. So tremendous for such a young, what, E3 or E4 or whatever he was at the time. That's really amazing. I want to tell you all about my new favorite fragrance for daily wear. It's called Novichok by Clandestine Laboratories. Novichok is distinctive and combines notes of cocoa powder, chocolate almond tort, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, tonka bean, Peru balsam, and musk tonkin. Unlike some of the other colognes I've worn in the past, I found that Novichok stays with me all day, which was a pleasant surprise. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you might already know why I was so happy to find this company and support them. The name itself comes from the very well-known Russian nerve agent Novichok, which has been used in recent years in several assassination attempts, which I've covered here on the podcast in previous episodes. The name is spelled differently, but rest assured, 
Once you put this on, you'll still make a killer impression wherever you go. Novichok is made in small batches by clandestine laboratories and, like their entire lineup, is available only via direct order. If you're not sure which of their fragrances is right for you, you can also check out the Discovery Stash. Six different mini bottles at one great price, which is perfect for finding your signature scent. So make sure to check them out either via a link in the show notes of this episode or at their website, clandestinelaboratories.com or on Instagram at Clandestine Laboratories. Yes, it's true. It, it is. And it's a good thing. He, that was, again, probably the only good decision he made. Right. Right. So once you actually were handed this investigation, where do you go from there since you have so much you know, detailed information that, you know, may or not, may not be true. Like, how do you start the investigation at that point after so many years? Well, the first thing I did was I just took one day and went out to Lancaster where, or Millersville, where Matrokin said he was going to go to try to find him. I went through the library, went through some city directories, and right away, there he was. He, sh he showed up in 1967 when Matrokin said he would. He was listed in the city directory as U.S. Army. And every year thereafter, up until the 1980s, Lipka was still in Lancaster. It showed he was married to his wife, Patricia. It showed that she was working at St. Joseph's Hospital in Lancaster. Again, confirming so much that Matrokin gave us. Then in 1974, 1975, suddenly she disappeared from the city directory. And about 1980, 1981, another woman appeared as a, as a spouse. So I realized there was a, either his first wife, Patricia, had died or there was some kind of a divorce. I went to the courthouse and was very fortunate to find that there was a divorce filing and even more fortunate to learn that it was an angry divorce, that she left him because of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. So it was always nice in the back of my mind to know I've got an ex-wife here who probably knew what he was involved in at NSA or possibly knew and was mistreated very badly. Also realized that they had a child. That's part of what the divorce was about. So with that information, the next day we went down to NSA and I delivered the bad news to the director of counterintelligence that they had had a spy in their midst. We thought they pulled the file on Lipka and right away, we realized the extent of access he had. He had access to every single document coming in and out of NSA. He worked in a, in a mail room, essentially, a teletype room. And everything Matrokin told us about him there was true. He did have a security clearance, a top secret security clearance. He had access to communications information, codes and ciphers. He had access to everything. So the panic set in then. So what we did was do some more background investigation on Lipka. We did some surveillance to find out what he's doing. We still don't know if he's in contact still with the KGB. But so far, this is the man Matrokin told us about. And so far, all the information is true. The question still is, did he actually pass any information to the Russians? So that was the next big step. Hmm. Okay. And what were you able to do to verify that? Once we knew what we knew about Lipka, we decided we would try a, probably seven months after we got the case, we would try a false flag approach to him. The purpose of a false flag is just taking an undercover FBI agent. In this case, we had Dmitry Druzinski pose as a GRU officer, which is the military side of the Soviet Union's intelligence service. And the reason we, we picked the GRU was because if we made any mistakes in dealing with Lipka, because if, if, we didn't know much about him in terms of what he had done, if we made mistakes, we could fall back on the fact that, well, we're just the GRU and we're taking over your file and we're just trying to get some information because you were such a valuable source. And that was the theory at the time. We wanted to say, because the Soviet Union had collapsed in 1991, we just, and the KGB, was renamed the SVR. We decided we would have the GRU taking over his case and wanting to make contact with him to find out what he did, see if he was willing to go back, see if he still had classified access. That was the, the thought. So we used Dmitry for that, Dmitry Drzezinski, because he had done these in the past. He had done these for the FBI on a number of occasions. 
He, he was actually a Russian speaker, but he spoke five different languages, including Arabic and Hebrew. He was comfortable in doing this. So again, the purpose of this, if Lipka didn't spy, that was just as important as to find out if he did. We clear him. So we were going to do this false flag, which meant make contact with Robert Lipka and see what he would be willing to tell us. And on May 12th and 13th, we did just that. Hmm. Okay. And did that go as expected once Drzezinski actually approached him? Well, actually, I should say, how did he approach him? Was it in person or another postcard in the mailbox like the, the Fishers did so many years before? This was done by phone call. It's always difficult to try to figure out how to do it. Once his wife and children were out of the house, Drzezinski made a phone call to the house, inviting him to this hotel that we were staging this event at, asking him to come, telling him that, that letting Lipka know very subtly that we knew what you'd done and we're here to get some more information and we'd love to see you. Please come to the hotel if you can. And Lipka was initially stunned. You could There was just silence on the phone. And uh, eventually he said, as Dimitri said, you know, I, I, I'm from my embassy. And he says, you don't have to say any more. And suddenly his, his voice changed and he was all in. I'll be there in 15 minutes. He told Dimitri he was driving a certain kind of a car and he would meet him at the front door. He was all excited. And sure enough, 15 minutes later, Lipka showed up at the hotel and asked the undercover agent to get into the car with him. And their conversation began. They had only talked for, I would say, six or seven minutes, just some small talk, a little bit of introduction. And Lipka was talking to Drzezinski about having just beaten a friend of his in chess. And Drzezinski looked honestly at Lipka and said, oh, do you play chess? And Lipka looked at him astonished and said, you didn't know that? And uh, Drzezinski had to look at him and say, well, you know, uh, we, are, we are just taking over. I don't have your file. I don't know much about you. Lipka says, before I say any more, right here on this magazine, I want you to fill this in. There's, and he puts an R, the letter R, and two dash lines on a magazine. and says, fill that in. You know what it is. And what Lipka wanted was Dmitry Drzezinski to provide him with his a code word that was given to him by his last KGB handler who told him that if you're ever contacted by anybody you don't know, if he's a KGB officer, he'll know this code word. That was Lipka's lifeline. And Dimitri didn't know what that R and two dash lines meant. Oh my gosh. It was, you know, now we don't know any of this is going on except for Drzezinski himself. So eventually, and we have this all on tape, but eventually Drzewski says, well, I, I, I don't know it. I'm, I'm GRU. Lipka says, well, you're saying GRU. I don't know what, anything, but he said, this is for my safety. It always was. And, you know, they talked about it. And Dimitri said, yes, I know it's for your safety. And that's what I'm here for your safety. And he was trying to stall the best he could. Lipka finally said, without even getting the code word, he gave up his, his motivation. He said, it was pure green greed. Mm. I, everything I did was, was for money. And, and then Dimitri said to him, well, this will be for money too. And then he never did write it down. Lipka said, if you can't fill this out, the next time we will, I won't talk to you again. That happens. They still continue to talk for an hour. And during that hour, Lipka also tells him that his wife knew what he was doing, which was a, an incredible gift to us. I knew, I suspected that his wife would have probably been in on it, two young lovers falling in love, getting married while he was at NSA, and he's filling a drop every two weeks. How could she not know? We didn't know that for sure. But then he admits that his wife knew about it. Uh, he made some other admissions. He even gave us what he would say if he was ever caught by the FBI. He had an alibi made up saying that there was a, a guy at NSA named Milt Roby, and he saw that he had passed away. And Lipka said that if anybody ever asked me what happened, my involvement in this thing, he said, oh, I'm just going to say everything I did, I did for Milt Roby. And when you're dead as a stone, no one will know the difference. 
Mm. So he had this alibi in his head, which he told to, to the undercover guy. So it was the first meeting. It was a beautiful meeting. But when the meeting ended, they had made arrangements to, to, to meet the next day to have a follow-up conversation. So we were encouraged by that, but we knew that if we didn't come up with a code word, perhaps the case would end right right there. It's wow. that important. Now, wow, look, uh, a, go ahead. That's a fast ticking deadline. I was going to say you've got one night basically to come up with the information he requires. And that was a, a real panic. We had to make tape, copies of the tape from the conversation. We had to listen to it. We listened to it over and over again. A number of us in the room, Demetra, the undercover guy was there. Myself and my co-case agent was there. Two guys from NSA and a prosecutor from the Department of Justice who we were all together. We played it over and over again. And and finally, and, and I have to, it was important. I asked Dimitri because when this all happened, it was about this chess thing. And I said, how did he really react? And he said, he physically backed away. Like when he said, you didn't know this, it was like a big deal that he didn't know Dimitri played chess. And it was just, and I'm looking at this code word and it's an R and two dash lines. Is it one word? Is it three words? Is it a sentence? Who knows what it is? But I remembered from looking through the, the illegals file, Peter and Ingeborg Fisher. There was a list of those 25 sites I told you about that were sabotage sites. Well, the very first site was a site in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And on that written piece of paper, there was a word spelled R-O-E-C-K. And nobody knew what it meant. The agents back in the 60s that worked the case didn't pay any attention to it. I saw it a number of times. It puzzled me. I thought it was a jumble or something, but it never made any sense. It wasn't a Russian word. It wasn't a German word. It was just a misspelled word. And that word had bothered me for probably the, the whole time I knew about the illegal case because everything else made sense. And it suddenly dawned on me that I'm a chess player as well as Dimitri is, that the code word could be Rook, that that was the illegal's pronunciation of Lipka's code word, which was given to them when they went over to, to Russia to pick up the assignment to go make contact with Lipka in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and leave that postcard. They were given his code word. Whether the code word was on the postcard or not, we don't know. We never saw the postcard. But I said, unless anybody's got a better chance or a better idea, I think Rook is the code word, and here's why. And I explained that about the illegals having this word that never has made any sense. But we do know that they were sent to Lancaster. We do know that they were in Russia to get this abstract that Matrokin had seen. And it just, we hoped it fit. If it didn't work, we'll see. I mean, Lipka did talk for an hour without having this code word before who he might continue to talk and, and then imp implicate himself in more espionage. So that's how it went. Didn't sleep much that night. The next morning, Lipka showed up as scheduled at uh, nine or 10 o'clock. Dimitri went out and met him in his van. Two things happened. As soon as he sat down, Lipka handed him a piece of paper and he said, circle the name on there. Truszynski said there were three Russian names on a piece of paper. And Lipkin wanted him to circle one. He says, you know who it is, one that means something to you. Druszynski had no idea which of these three names meant anything. They were just Russian names that meant absolutely nothing to Druszynski. He said to Lipka, well, they mean something, but, you know, in what connection? Lipka said, you don't know the one of the names on there? And, and uh, Dmitry Truszynski decided that this was time to try the code word. And he says, does Rook mean anything to you? And with that, Lipka said, yes. You know, he brought his hand up to his chest. He, he gave out a deep sigh. They both laughed. They shook hands. And obviously, Rook was the proper code word. Lipka felt comfortable enough that he went up to the hotel room with Truszynski they sat for another hour, hour and a half, and discussed some more of the case, and some of the things that he did. He talked about some of the locations of his drop sites in Maryland and D.C. He exchanged new code words with Krasinski and mailing addresses and post office boxes. 
didn't give us a lot, but he did say that his wife went with him on some of his meets or some of his drops and gave us some more good information, but he never completely confessed to anything. Hmm. You know, John, I'm really trying to wrap my head around that, that first meeting of his. He had such an unusual mix of caution and just risk-taking, really, because he was very smart, obviously, to you know want to hear the, the code name that he was given, but then he continued to talk for an hour and he made some statements that he should have known would kind of implicate him, you know, if that was what was actually happening here, which, which it was. So why do you think that he continued to speak even when he had some doubts about Dimitri's actual, you know, origin or, or being with the GRU in the first place? Well, I think that's the, the beauty of the false flag contact. I think if, if you didn't do anything wrong and you got a call, from Dmitry Druzinski inviting you to a hotel room, a man you never heard of, and you had never been a spy, or you wouldn't go, you'd hang up. It would be a crank call. Mm -hmm. But if you are a spy, suddenly here's a guy 20 years later in your life, you thought you were free and clear. Suddenly you get this call from the blue from somebody from the Russian embassy who seems to know that you were active with the Russians years ago and who wants to see you again with some new information, you almost have to trust him. You almost have to go out and see who this guy is. So he may have, he had to go. I mean, we were almost 100% sure that he would show up. If he didn't show up, we had some other contingency plans. But I mean, he, he came right over. And I think he had to sit and talk with Dimitri a lot of what he said, he he diverted. I mean, if Dimitri would ask a, a sensitive question, he would either not answer it or just bring up a different topic. He talked a lot about horse racing. He talked a lot about Ollie North and a lot of obscure things. He said he could exchange money for gold. He made a lot of silly comments, but nothing really important. But I think he was as much trying to feel out Druszynski is, is to, as Druszynski was trying to get information from him. And I think, you know, he got some pointed questions and it, it looked bad if he didn't answer them. So he kind of, I, I think he, he, he bought off on it. Uh, Lipka would later say that the whole false flag effort against him was very elementary and any high school, any elementary school kid could have figured this out. Well, guess what? He didn't figure it out because <laughs> he really implicated himself as to being involved in espionage with the, with the KGB. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. What a strange guy to be so smart in so many ways and so blind in others, but I guess it worked out for the investigation in the end. John, since you mentioned that you had other strategies or avenues you could have taken for the investigation, if he had just flat out denied meeting Dimitri in the first place, hung up or whatever have you, would, do you think you would have been able to put the case together based on the other evidence available, like the testimony of the ex-wife or anything like that? Or would it kind of been dead in the water at that point without Lipka, you know, implicating himself? Well, if we had interviewed the, what we would have done if, if we weren't able to make contact with him and, and there was still hope that we could do it that way, we might have gone to a racetrack and met him there just out in the cold or something or knock, knocked on his door even. There were some of the operational considerations. But, I mean, if we didn't do Lipka first, and, and we thought about this, let's do the ex-wife first. Had we talked to her first, we may have found out what his code word was because she actually knew it. Now, I'm not sure that I would have th thought to ask her that, not knowing that there was one or not thinking about it. Of course, that was high, high in our minds when we did talk to her, and she did admit it. She actually told us that he leaned over at a James Bond movie during a chess scene and whispered to her that his code word was Rook. And I went out and rented all the James Bond movies and went through them. Fortunately, the second one I looked at was from Russia with Love. And right at the very beginning of the movie, there's a big chess scene. And that's when Lipka actually leaned over to his wife and told her his code word. But I mean, she could have given us some really positive information that we could have used against him. Maybe we could have tried it again in a different way, knowing the code word. Because the, the, there was a big problem that we, we made in that case. And it was really nobody's fault. One, Lipka always had his doubts about Druszynski. 
And one of the reasons was he didn't realize the name Pavel Grachev that was written on that piece of paper that he handed to Dmitry. Pavel Grachev was the Soviet defense minister at the present time. And Pavel Grachev, if Dmitry Druzinski was truly a GRU officer, he would know that Pavel Grachev was his boss. It would be like me saying, I'm an FBI agent and I don't know who J. Edgar Hoover is. Mm. It was that bad. Okay. And so keep in mind, uh, Lipka was getting mixed messages from us too. So he was almost as confused as we were. <laughs> this guy knows my code word, but he doesn't know his own boss. That kind of a thing. Sure. And I think in the end, didn't work. You know, that's why we, we didn't make this thing last forever because we were getting less information and Lipka was getting more emboldened with goofy stories and things that had no, no pertinence to the case. But we could have gone to the ex-wife. We could have interviewed some colleagues at NSA. We could have interviewed other people. In the end, I think we did it the right way and it worked out. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we, it obviously did in the end because you got a, a very solid conviction, as we all know. I'm curious, how did Matrokin himself, he kind of factored into the investigation, the person, not just the information that he provided, right? Right. Well, the prosecutors wanted to use Matrokin as, as the, the so source of the information that gave us the case in the first place. We went over and talked to him one, on one occasion. I mean, he had to deal with the translator. So the interviews are very tedious. You know, He's no better than Robert Lipka in terms of the fact that he was committing espionage against his country. But sometimes you have to like the guy that's helping you more than the guy that hurt you. So he was easy to deal with for me. He was like a, a grandfather type. I liked him as a person. I felt sorry for him. He had a son that had a severe disability, which was one of the reasons he came out was to get better medical help for his son. Matrokin was hard to deal with. He helped us, but it took a few days to realize that he never even saw Lipka's file, that he had only seen that little abstract. He described KGB files, which are no different than FBI files. I mean, we spent hours going over what the file looked like, what the, you know, and only to get really little information other than it looks like an FBI file. Files are files. He, you know, at the end of this interview for a week we spent with him, he just blew up and said, you know, you don't catch a cockroach with a king. I mean, he thought he was God's gift to the world because he delivered all this stuff. So we had to resettle his handlers, his British handlers helped us. And he came back to the United States a few months later and was a lot more friendly, agreed that he would testify in court as to what he knew about the case. He could talk about KGB techniques and things like that. He turned out to be a, a pretty important guy in the case. Wow. That's funny how much his ego came into play. I love that statement. You don't catch a cockroach with a king. I can see how he would have been insufferable for a lot of people. And he was. And, you know, unfortunately, he didn't realize you have to have a king because these cases are tough. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we would have the problem with him again in the Trofimov case. He would refuse to testify in court. And uh, wow. that was a big problem. But by that time, he had lost his wife. And I think he was ill. He, he didn't live too much longer after that, but he, he wouldn't cooperate. So I was fortunate that we got him to cooperate. I took him up to my office one time and we just had a private moment. He saw my kids' pictures on my desk and he looked out the window and said, this office looks like I had some pine trees out in the window. It looks like my office in Russia. And I talked about my kids and I talked about his son. And I said, look, if you ever need anything, you can call my, here's my home number. And he said, no one ever gave him a home number. And I just did it like anybody else would do it, not for any reason. I mean, I, I would have entertained him for a weekend if he wanted to come to Pennsylvania. He was a nice enough guy. Actually, I did get to see him after this case was over in 2000 when we were trying to recruit him to work with us on the Trofimov case. I spent a week with him in California, and I would order food for him because I knew he had bad teeth. I, I knew what he liked. I got to know him very well. He was a good guy, but he was kind of brokenhearted. Mm, that's a shame. You know, I've, I've heard his name come up so many times in so many contexts because of all the stuff he got. And it's amazing to talk to you and you were sitting in the office with him and eating food with him and all that. And he's a guy that had a tremendous, tremendous impact on our understanding of the entire Cold War. And, you know, you just got to sit down face to face with him. That's pretty impressive. It was really, it was really a magical time, a really great experience. Mm. And that's one of the best times I had in the Bureau. It's fantastic. 
So John, at what point did you or the prosecutors or well, I should say, at what point was the decision made to go ahead and arrest Lipka? Like when did you have enough for a successful prosecution? Well, I think once we had the, had the information from his ex-wife and her cooperation, we secured her cooperation. Now we had the the contacts with, with Lipka. We had the information that we thought he passed. Truszynski had one big meeting with him in December of 93, at which time we paid him up $10,000 in cash. We had him look at some NSA documents. He admitted he might have passed something like one and something like the other one didn't pass these kind of things. Didn't know if it was true, but we gave him the opportunity. It just was overwhelming. If, if, if you looked at the conversations they had, the, the overwhelming evidence against him was, yeah, he was involved with the Soviets. He never did admit to any particular document, but the prosecutors thought that we had enough to prosecute him for conspiracy to commit espionage. To prove espionage, we would have to have an individual document. If we had 20 documents, we could have had 20 counts of espionage, but we had no documents that we could prove, none that he admitted to other than something like that. So they decided to go with a, with a conspiracy charge using the illegals, using his KGB handler. There was an interesting part. The illegals did go to New York one time and fill a drop themselves. And their handler, their KGB handler, uh, Artem Shokin, actually came to the drop site after they left and picked up the information that they put down. So there is a connection, a, an intelligence drop between two KGB illegals, the KGB handler, the fact that the KGB illegals then go to Lipka's house and leave a postcard and come back. So there's the conspiracy right in and of itself. And the fact that he did admit to, you know, selling, passing stuff, information from NSA to Dimitri. He had his alibi made up. He did it because it was just for money, strictly for money, as he would say. You had a conspiracy case. So they decided that in 1996 that we would arrest him after we interviewed him. We were going to give him a, a, an interview first, see if he would confess to anything or even further implicate himself. So we did that in February of January, February of 96, just before he was arrested. My co-case agent and myself went and interviewed Lipka at his house for about four hours. It was a kind of a disaster. A lot of things happen. It's bad to interview a person in their own home. They're comfortable. The doorbell rings. Water delivery came to them. The phone rings. Every time that happens, you lose some tempo in your interview. We had Lipka actually say to us that he put some things out for a guy named Milt Roby. And that was the closest we came to having him confess. I mean, he's giving us the alibi that he was going to use. He said he put things out for Milt Roby. And with that, the phone rings, and it's an attorney that he had that he used when he bought his house, a real estate attorney. And he makes the comment to this attorney that I've got two FBI agents here, and they're accusing me of being a spy. What should I do? Well, even a, you know, a kid in high school that wants to be an attorney would tell him to shut up, which is exactly what the attorney did. So he, he pulled the attorney privilege on us. We had to leave. Again, had we been in a hotel room, maybe it would have worked. But, you know, we, we knew he was leery of meeting in a hotel room. He only met with Dimitri once in a hotel room. We tried out several other times and he would never go in. So it was the only option we really had. But anyway, after, you know, he made some, you know, some more, imp, you know, statements. So we arrested, we got auth authorization to arrest him the next day, went out and arrested him. And I don't, I don't know if he was surprised or not, but I think he knew it was coming by that point. Did, yeah. Did he, was he shocked when you showed up at the door? I mean, or did he cover it well? I mean, this was years and years after he thought that everything had, had slipped the radar. I mean, or did he not quite believe Dimitri right from the start? Well, I think he bought off on Dimitri. I think he was questionable about Dimitri. But the day before we interviewed him, we actually had a little operation where we, we got his ex-wife to give him a phone call who he hadn't spoken to in 20 years. And she told him that she had received a telephone call from the FBI and that they wanted to come talk to her. And she didn't know what to do. And she actually 
she was scared to death to make the phone call just out of pure nerves, which came across very well. Like she was just scared that she actually really got the phone call. And he, he mm-hmm. started to panic and he says, can we meet somewhere? And we wanted him to do that. We wanted him to meet with his ex-wife, talk about espionage further, you know, it, incriminate himself into his spying activities. One last piece of the pie before we interviewed him. Mm-hmm. So he did go down. He met her in, in Maryland at a, at a shopping mall in the eatery section. They did talk for an hour. She said a couple times, Bob, it was espionage. And he just would go, Shh, he shushed her. <laughs> you don't know that. He told her his Milt Roby defense that he would use if he was ever caught. He, he really didn't say, again, he kind of implicates himself, but he never really did. He was still careful. So when he came back home, when we talked to him, I don't think he was terribly surprised because he knew the FBI was going to talk to her. So I think he handled it fairly well. But in, in the interview, he was, he was, the sweat was coming down his side of his face. And he was several times he stood up and he pulled his shirt off and showed us some scars on his back and neck from some surgery that he had. I mean, it was just the tension was just killing him. Oh, so wow. it was, it, you know, his body language is clear that this guy is guilty as sin, but he just wouldn't give it up. So when we did arrest him the next day, I told him when we left him that, that day of the interview that we would be back soon. It was sooner than he thought, probably, but uh, <laughs> uh, that was the last conversation I had with him until he would. He finally agreed to plead guilty, and we did have some sit downs to see if you know he could work a plea agreement out. Hmm. Wow, is that what happened in the end? Did he get a plea, or was did he go through with the trial? No, he eventually he got a, a lawyer, and he realized that you know this was there was a. a a subsequent, you know, life sentence here that he could be facing. And he agreed to an 18 year maximum sentence with a $10,000 fine and $10,000 restitution for the money that we, we gave him during the undercover operation. But we told him that we would consider a lesser sentence if he would talk to us about what he passed, tell us the documents he passed, cooperate with us, and if he could pass a polygraph, we would seek a reduced sentence from that 18-year sentence, from that maximum sentence. And his lawyer was into it. We sat with him. His lawyer pleaded with him to cooperate. He did tell us that he did, you know, he belittled all he did. He said, I only made like eight drops and I was only paid $1,250 and I only passed four documents. but. When he was finally given the polygraph, he just bombed it completely. Oh, so man. for for whatever reason, he was not willing as much as he pled in court for his sons. You know, he put on a big show for the judge that Abraham Lincoln forgave all the Confederates during the Civil War and that they were able to go home to their families and that what he had done was should be forgiven and he should be allowed to go home to his boys because boys who have a father in prison don't turn out well. Well, you know, if he really cared about his sons, all he had to do was cooperate with us and tell us what he passed. And he would have had a reduced sentence and would have been home with his boys and probably no time, maybe even time serves for all I know. But he, he didn't do it. So I was left to believe and still I'm left to believe that the stuff he passed was so horrible to the security of the nation and or to people, soldiers being killed in Vietnam, that he just could not, he couldn't face that and was willing to take the jail time rather than give it up because it would just certainly make no sense to get out of jail quickly and be home with your family. You know, again, there's that little part of Lipka that makes him a little bit sociopathic, smarter than everybody. He might just want to have beat me and not let me know the, what he passed. You know, he's, he's also that kind of person. So I don't know. I don't know why that happened, but he did get the full 18 years, which the judge didn't even have to do. I mean, that was just our recommendation. The judge can lower or raise that amount, that, you know, ceiling. But he gave him the full 18 years and Lipka served almost 11 of those 18. Okay. 11 years. Did he pass away in prison? I know he has passed since the sentencing, at least. 
No, he was released in December of 2006 by a parole board. And he lived, he, his wife, his second wife had divorced him. He moved up to Erie, the Erie, Pennsylvania area with an old, with a friend of his, a woman friend of his. And he died, I think, in 2013. Okay. So he got about seven years outside of six or seven years out of jail before he died. Okay. And so to this day, we don't know for certain what all he passed from the NSA at that time, but we can assume it was extremely damaging, though, to say the least. Yes. If it was NSA material, top secret <laughs> NSA material, it was extremely damaging. He also did write a letter to the prosecutor and said, yes, some soldiers died as a result of my information. But again, think about my boys, you know, and he said in the 60s, but think about my boys in the 90s. So he still, you know, he tells us that soldiers died because of his information that he passed. Yet that's in the past. Think about my boys now and how they need me. I mean, so we do know that he was responsible for some deaths by his own hand in Vietnam. How many, we don't know. And again, mm -hmm. I, I just can't help but think that he, he would, if there were a lot, I mean, if he passed troop movements, if the Vietnamese, Viet Cong knew where the American troops are going to be, you know, it's devastating information. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's amazing. I, that's, I mean, of course, I and you and everybody else wishes that we knew everything that he passed. But it, it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong here, but oftentimes it's kind of difficult when you do like a damage assessment after this kind of thing, it's actually kind of difficult to tie it to loss of life often, but you know, like sources get burned and whether or not they get killed or disappear or whatever have you, you know, in various contexts. But I mean, if he himself knows and is even able to admit that people died because of the information that he passed, that's, that's really incredible. And it makes you wonder what else he's hiding. Exactly. And it is frustrating to me. I mean, I like to think that, you know, I'm, I'm confident, I'm happy that we got what we got. I'm, I'm happy that we sent a message to the public that if you commit espionage, you, we're never going to stop looking for you. We're going to track you down. We're going to see that justice is served. I think in, in many ways, justice was served for Robert Lipka, but there's still that, that piece of me that wishes we knew more. And hopefully one day with some more defections from the Soviet Union or Russia, Maybe someday we'll actually see the Robert Lipka file and see what indeed he did pass. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a very common theme with so many stories from that era is that there are still a lot of loose ends that, you know, probably will never be tied or cut off in the end. But, you know, we can still hope, especially if we got some stuff out of the archives already, maybe more will come to light one day. Well, that's a hope. That's for sure. Yep. So... Yeah, John, this was fascinating, and your book was fascinating as well. I know we haven't had the opportunity to talk about every single detail, of course, but there is a lot more in the book that we didn't cover, especially some of the stuff about Dimitri and the way that he manipulated Lipka and vice versa, really. But that, that was really fascinating, really tense scenes there in the book. So are you writing another book? Or are you working on anything else at the moment? Well, after the uh, Lipka book, I wrote two more books. I wrote one called Cypress Shade, which was about my experiences in Mississippi working civil rights cases. It's kind of an FBI memoir of that time. And then I just finished a book this past October called Missing in Matagami, which is a true story, a true cold case about a young lady who disappeared in the wilds of the subarctic Canada in 1977 who still has not been found or heard from. Wow. And that's just come out. They're all on my on my website, johnwhitesidebooks.com, if anybody's interested. Yeah, absolutely. johnwhitesidebooks.com, you said, right? That's it, yeah. Okay, yeah, fantastic. I have not read your other books yet. I, I was aware that you'd written a couple, but I'll definitely have to check those out because the, the cold case stuff is absolutely fascinating to me. It's a very sad story about a girl who had a lot going for her. She was a very talented girl, very musically talented, very bright, graduated cum laude from Duke University after two and a half years, had some kind of, we think, emotional or mental issues, just went up, drove her car to a rural spot in Canada, it was seen by a fish and game warden, spoke to and never seen again. Mm. So a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of choices to guess on what the evidence is. We're still trying our best to find her. Hmm. 
Well, yeah, I hope that there's some closure on that one day, but the book sounds interesting already for sure. Good. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate your time. This is an amazing story and it's, it's so great that you were able to play such a central role in it and, and, you know, be there among one of the biggest cases of the Cold War, even though it finally ended years and years later. And there's, you know, Justin, there's a, a reason behind the title Fool's Mate in that book, too. I don't know if you're a chess player, but Fool's Mate is the worst move you can make in chess. It's a two-move checkmate. There was something in that book about Lipka trying to teach me that move. So that's why that cover, that's the name of the book. For that's right. I do remember that now. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm not much of a chess player myself, unfortunately, but that was a wonderful tie in. And that really is a perfect title for the book as well. So it's very serendipitous that that happened to you with Lipka. Well, thank you very much, Justin. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, John. So everybody, if you haven't picked it up yet, the book is called Fool's Mate by John Whiteside. I will link it up in the show notes of this episode as well. And it's a great read. It's, you know, I burned through it in probably two days or so myself. And John, I know it took you a lot longer than two days to write, but that's how quickly I read through it. Well, I appreciate it, Justin. It was something I wanted to leave because even though it made the papers, there were a lot of people to thank. And there still are today. There were many, many FBI people and people from other agencies, the NSA, CIA, the prosecutors. So many people had a hand in the case, all the surveillance people. It's a real effort to work one of these. And it was, I was so happy that it worked out because there's so few of us in the business of espionage in the FBI that get a real chance to work a real case all the way through like this one. So I've truly been blessed. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I know it's absolutely a team effort and it's good that you were able to acknowledge those people and, and bring that story to light as well. Well, thank you so much for your time, John. I really appreciate it today. Thank you, Justin. All right. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram at spycraft101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.